a historian, champion of the museum, um, a little bit of everything here. <laughs> and so absolutely, you know, um, Mr. Albany. And then with him is Tony Opalka, who is the city historian and the director of the Irish, uh, the Jeannie Mac, of the Firefighters Museum. Uh, which is the other Irish <laughs> museum. Uh, tonight, we're delighted. Thank you, Colleen, we're, we're there. So hopefully Zoom people can hear us. We have a, a microphone down there attached. I think we're live on, certainly Facebook, we might not be live on YouTube, but it's a little bit of a mix and gathering because we have a live audience um, here and then we have ourselves in, inside here. So I'm sharing with the Zoom audience now. Anyway, tonight's program is part of the Hudson Valley um, series, they sponsored a series that we're doing called Collars, Canals and Conflagrations, uh, the, cap the Irish in the Capital Region. So we've had two or three events in this series already. We taught, we had Kid Milani's house here, we had uh, Toss the Feathers who did a kind of a musical history lesson of the Capital Region. And uh, I think I gave a talk about Irish women in the labour movement locally. And here we have now tonight our two historians. So uh, without further ado, because I've already made a hames of everything, we're going to get started and welcome everyone to our in-house. Thank you for coming out. Um, we'll mask up again in a second, but thanks to you all for joining and take it away, men. <laughs> so who has my remote? Me. So that's your remote. Okay. Mm -hmm. And right. my report, my yeah, well, remote is gone. On the, hmm? the arrows on the side. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, stand up together, I guess. Yeah. There we are. <laughs> oh, very good. That works. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank you, Elizabeth, and um, we might as well jump right into it. Um, the um, Every city seemed to have its great fire, and Albany was no exception. Ours happened on August 17th, 1848. Um, Chicago had Mrs. O'Leary's cow, and we had the washerwoman at the Albion Hotel. Um, I don't know whether there's any sexism there, blaming a woman in both <laughs> cases, but that's the story. I don't know whether it, it might be lore, it might be true, but at least that's the way the newspapers reported it. And a lot of um, the, uh, what, I, what I wanna talk about is the background. What was the city like in 1848 and how devastating was this fire really? Um, the setting, I wanted to start with a, with a view. Um, okay, what did I, oh, okay. so. Oh, it okay. changed over there. Yeah. Okay. And now oh, so that one. okay. Um, this is a view of, depending on if you want to pronounce it the way the French would say it, Key Street or Quay Street, which was the street that ran right along the riverfront. And this was envisioned by artist Len Tantillo. And I use this slide because I don't think it's really much different from what it looked like. Um, he says this is 1813. 45 years later, it probably looked fairly similar to this, except that the riverfront would have been that much busier because the Erie Canal opened in 1825 and the city just grew by leaps and bounds. And one of the major um, construction efforts along the river was, of course, the pier. And that will figure into the fire because the pier was built to enclose the basin, which was the um, eastern end of the Erie Canal, and it was filled with ships at all times. And along the riverfront were warehouses and industries and so on. A block up was Broadway, which was the mer main mercantile street for the city. Is this? Yeah, you're fine. Uh, is the microphone? Just hang on one second. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I just have to stop the share because we're not actually live streaming it. It's, yeah. I don't know why it's not live streaming, so I'm just going to record it. It says it's live on Facebook, but it hasn't gone for computer. All right, we're back on, but it, it wasn't, the live stream wasn't working for us, so we just have to go ahead. Right. Okay, <laughs> we're all set. Okay, um, Broadway was the main mercantile street. And then, as you can imagine, as the city moved west, you got residences and um, other types of industries and so on. At the time, the city was the second largest in the state, and it became that way because, to a large extent, of the Erie Canal. It really, as I said, made the city grow by leaps and bounds. Also going to include the uh, steamboats, too. And the steamboats, right. They were there as well. Era. So, um, yeah, and of course, this is right at the beginning. This, this image is 
from 1813 and the steamboats had only been around for a few years. So um, you don't really see one in Lens um, depiction. Um, in the, uh, not surprisingly, every type of goods was available um, in the downtown area. Um, and that really, at the time, Broadway was the main mercantile street and Pearl Street still had a lot of residences on it. So you, it's kind of funny the way we look at it now. And another thing is that at the time of the fire, the even uh, 20 years later, they actually refer to Dove Street as the western edge of the city. So you can imagine how much um, it was, how everything was down here. Um, people lived within walking distance of their places of employment. And um, they also did all their shopping and their um, any type of business institutional um, buildings were down here and so on. So this was really the entire hub of activity. There was no uh, public transportation um, available in the city. So everything was in walking distance. And of course, with the hills, people tended to try to stay as close to the river as possible. So you didn't have to walk up the, um, up the hill. So um, a lot of these um, buildings that were affected by the fire were not the kind of um, apartment upstairs over the, the uh, store. These were the major buildings. They also included a lot of inns and hotels. And um, so it was really like where everything took place. The residents were mostly scattered a little bit to the west and north and south of the downtown area. Um, the, um, the fancier the occupation, the higher up the hill you lived. And of course, that was no surprise. That still um, works today. Um, so what happened? Um, let's see. OK. A apparently, according to the story, the red arrow shows the location of the Albion Hotel. And what you see there is the neighborhood that had been the common pasture of the city. Um, let's see, I don't have a pointer, unfortunately, but this is Madison Avenue. And the Steamboat Square was just at the foot of Madison Avenue. And where the red arrow is, is Broadway going down. Actually, probably the only thing anybody would recognize today down there would be the U-Haul building because virtually everything else is gone. And part of the grid that you see is occupied by 787 and the railroad tracks. And when you get a little further south, um, there are a few industrial buildings that remain, but not very many. Um, so the story goes that the washerwoman was working um, and her bonnet caught on fire. Apparently she threw it aside and it caught on fire. And by the time she ran out to the street and some accounts say that she was hysterical and couldn't even speak about what was going on because the building had burst into flames. We don't have her name. We don't have her name, no. Mm -hmm. But I don't know whether her name was O'Leary or what, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a good chance. I mean, she could have been an Irish working woman, a uh, washerwoman, but uh, I don't know. There's, there's never, I've never seen anything with a name connected with it. It's unfair. What's that? Is it unfair? Unfair. In Chicago, they don't even know the name of the cow. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, she, um, you know, and right at the time that the fire started, the wind whipped up, and this was supposed to be the hottest day of the year. Um, it was 93 degrees. It happened about one o'clock in the afternoon, and the fire burned for um, four hours. Um, but what we get here. So here's the newspaper cover, one of the newspapers. Um, I use the, um, the uh, one of the headlines for the title slide here. One said appalling conflagration, another um, used another adjective. Um, appalling conflagration, 500 buildings burned, 30 million or $3 million property lost. Um, and what amazes me about this is that Without the benefit of the internet, by a day after the fire, they had a list, a full page spread, like kind of like opening out the Times Union into uh, you know two pages. They had a list of virtually every building, every residence, 
what the contents were, what the businesses were, how much was insured, how much was lost. And it was really, I mean, I thought it was amazing that they could do this without the benefit of, you know, having a list of, you know, things where you could just click on and find out all these things. So, you know, we've got it good, but they had it good back then too, maybe to a, a simpler, um, uh, in a simpler way. I wonder if the volunteer firehouses had a list of their customers since they paid for the privilege of having the volunteers. Well, yeah, they, I mean, that actually that was so paid they, for by city taxes. Well, they might so, have had a, a list of who they were. Yeah, but one actually in one of the volunteer houses actually got burned up in the fire because it was out, it was down on Broadway, just north of the Steamboat Square. Um, and that was uh, Daniel D. Tompkins Engine Company number eight. So that was, um, but that was one of the companies, one of the 13 companies that existed in Albany at the time. Um, here is a, here's a great image, um, you know, obviously a conjectural image. This was published in something that makes me think of like every little boy's desire to become a fireman at age five. It's called The Fireman's Own Book. And it was published in 1860 and it covered fires throughout the world. And this is what they um, used for the image of our fire of August 17th. Um, it's hard to know whether there were buildings um, that looked anything like this. I have a feeling that the flames might be exaggerated, but I did see just today some uh, pictures of um, a fire in Cohoes from 25 years ago, or 35 years ago, I guess. And it really looked like this. So maybe this wasn't so exaggerated. But um, the ironic thing is that there was another fire right across the street from where we are here on Quackenbush Street well, that day. Um, and so, and there were some men that were still fighting that fire when this one came in, uh, this alarm came in and fires were very common and very devastating. Um, 1848 was a particularly bad year, not only because of this uh, major fire, but there were a bunch of other fires um, including one in April that destroyed 30 buildings. I think the one right down here on Quackenbush Street might have involved 10 or 20 buildings. So this was not unusual, which is, you know, fire was um, a major problem right from the earliest settlements, probably of man <laughs> and woman. <laughs> so, can't remember what's 50 50,000 people in Albany's the size of what Troy is today right. but, but they're not spread out so it's very uh, compact and you're dealing with a world that all your heat is by fire or your light at night is by fire and uh, everything is by fire and uh, we they don't have the uh, some of the precautions that we have today, there's no sprinkler systems. And also even some of the clothes that we buy today are, uh, are safer to have like a, a pajamas for children, things like that. They won't burn. Well, this is not true in, yeah. in 48. You know, as, as um, uh, Charlie Garing, who has been translating Dutch um, documents for the past 50 years in talking about fire protection under the Dutch, he said, well, they heated with wood, they cooked with wood, they had wood buildings, they had thatched roofs, and what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> and so, you know, I guess we're seeing that, you know, he's talking about a period 200 years before this. Now the map, the larger map is from 1850. So it's actually after um, the fire has happened and if you were to look at this very closely, you would see that the um, area that was devastated had already started to be built up because this was the center of town and you couldn't leave this vacant for uh, any period of time. So this is kind of um, related to the map. Uh, it's a Google map on the other on the right that shows the area today. So you can see um, a good portion of what was burned is now taken up by highways and um, the uh, you can see the pier and the uh, um, the larger map the old map and the basin 
And then there's a block outside of the fire, the main part. Um, this part here is actually um, the Columbia Street Market. So if you can imagine that it stopped at about Hudson Avenue, but burning embers flew through the air and set the Columbia Street Market afire, and that was destroyed as well. Yeah. So I'm curious, in the newer map, there is no island there. Was that all land residential? Right. That was, the basin was filled in, and then it became railroad tracks, and now it's 787. Mm -hmm. So that, that basin, that straight line that you see that parallels the words Hudson River, that's all artificial. That was built when the Erie Canal opened. So the, the water to the north of that is the basin, or I'm sorry, to the west of that is the basin. So inside that basin enclosed, or I mean, I'm sorry, the pier enclosed the basin. Um, and that's where there were actually ships destroyed in this fire as well. There were canal boats and schooners that were um, parked in the basin. And some were able to uh, be led away, but some were actually destroyed by the fire. You know, building next to the water was the way you created a community from colonial times. And there's places like uh, Back Bay in Boston, uh, but particularly here on the waterfront where we put a super highway in and everybody says, all that archeology span is gone. They must have, it's all filled in. Back Bay, Boston is filled in the land becomes so valuable, there's not enough of it. So what you do is you start making your, uh, making your swamps filled, you make your lakes filled, and you make above all your riverfront filled. So that sometimes you'll look and you'll think everything was probably right where that highway is. Not really, a lot of that is filled land. And the real archeological uh, archeologi richness is back closer to, uh, uh, Broadway. Yeah, and actually, even before the basin was built, they had started pushing the riverbank yeah. out. So Broadway was almost on the riverfront. So I think probably where Montgomery Street is, which is where the parking lot is behind us here, I think that was about where the riverfront was. So it kept getting pushed out even before that. So, um, you know, as Jack said, there's, that's all filled land. I always said when uh, Henrik Quackenbush lived here in the house, he, if he had a baseball or just a good rock and he could throw it to the east, it would splash. It would be in the Hudson River. Yeah, so, but, you know, and, and even there are other parts of the city, like down at the, the furthest south part of the pasture, that land was filled in as well. So the riverfront, the, the course of the river has been changed. And if you look where the words Albion Hotel are in this um, image, that's an island on the Rensselaer side. And I don't think that's discernible either. I think that the uh, channel between yep. the riverbank and that island has been filled in as well. Because the river was too, too. It was too, too valuable. The land was just too valuable to you know, let it go to water. It was more valuable as buildable lots. So you can see, as I said now, the, you know, it's hard to um, imagine what this was like because of the fact that so much has been changed. But when we did a walking tour of this um, fire a couple of years ago, we couldn't even figure out where the Albion Hotel was because it's probably under one of the highway pylons or something, yeah. you know, where, um, you know, the ramps go for the uh, uh, mall highway. So this is what was in the newspaper the day after. And you can really get an impression of what um, was actually affected by the fire map of the burnt district. They called it the burnt district for quite a while because um, obviously the city was concerned about what was gonna go back there. They talked about straightening and widening the streets because this was all, a lot of this was the village of Beverwick that was at this time 200 years old. So the streets were narrow and windy. And um, they, again, talking about the value of the land, you know, if they change the course of the streets, they would have more buildable lots. So you get an idea, again, this 
this um, street plan is very difficult to find. You'd have to walk around behind Broadway to see some of the um, locations of the streets. I, I joked at the end of the tour that when we ended up on Hudson Avenue and, and uh, Broadway, or actually Liberty Street behind it, it kind of looks like what it must have looked like right after the fire, because the only building behind there now is 48 <laughs> Hudson Avenue. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was kind of an odd tour because there was nothing to see. We were walking the path of the fire, but um, there weren't any buildings, certainly there weren't any buildings left from the, the fire period, but also there aren't any even from years after that. So what's uh, interesting is you would think with what went on, and it must have happened very quickly to say how long the fire yeah, lasted. The fire lasted and no, about four hours and and the, nobody died. No, they don't know. They never got a, a um a, a real count. At least a couple of people did die. There was a fire earlier in the year in a building that was affected by this and the building hadn't been fully demolished and the walls fell and killed a couple of little boys. And then I think there was another pair of deaths, but nobody knows exactly how many um, people died. One of the things too, and this is you know hard for us to imagine now, is that um, there was mutual aid. Uh, you know, obviously all of the fire um, companies, all the engine companies and hook and ladders in Albany were here, but so were Troy, West Troy, which is Waterville, the Waterville Arsenal, Schenectady, and the, um, the, what would it be then? I guess the village of Cohoes, yeah. They left Cohoes at 9 p.m. and got here at one in the morning and there were some hot spots. So that trip wasn't for nothing. <laughs> so, sure. um, and it was just, you know, this is the way it was, you know, when you're talking about very, what we would think of now as primitive firefighting equipment of hand pumpers. And um, at this time, there were probably about five or 600 Albany firefighters and, you know, working the hand pumpers they, the men would last about 15 minutes before they had to be relieved. So you had a constant, um, you know, cycling through of, of the firefighters and the water was drawn from cisterns and um, suction hoses from the river and um, reservoirs that the city built because firefighting was obviously such an important part of city life. So um, I'm not sure if I have another slide here. Ah, I wanted to end my part of this um, since we're here at the Irish Museum with the um, chief engineer, which we now call the fire chief, James McQuaid. He was um, what I think of as a brilliant man. He really knew firefighting. And some of the things I've read about him, you know, he's, he was said to have had a nearly national reputation in firefighting. And um, he wrote a letter um, in 1865 when the Civil War was going on. This is obviously long after the fire um, about what changes needed to be made in firefighting in Albany. And he, and he um, addressed a couple of issues. One was the Civil War was going on and the number of available firefighters was diminished. Another was that these hand pumpers were really going out of style and we needed um, steamers here, steam engines. And a group of businessmen got together and purchased a steam engine independent of the Albany Fire Department. And they thought so much of James McQuaid that they named the steam engine after him. So you get to see him and the steam engine that was um, um, named after him, which was purchased in 1864. And that was the beginning of the period where reorganization of the fire department was considered. And it finally happened in 1867 when it became a paid professional department that it is today. So I'm gonna let Jack okay. do more of the talking now. Well, this is a, a time when uh... Albany is under extraordinary stress, 
particularly all of New York State and all of the uh, seaboard, because the Great Irish Famine is occurring. And the famine starts in the, the really August of, uh, of 45, and it's followed by a, a really horrendously cold winter, which means that the deaths are going up in, in 46, people are getting out. 47, refer to the black 47, and you'll notice this is the same time that, that we're talking about. People are finding out, we gotta get out of here. And the famine, without giving a whole talk on the famine, is this, uh, this uh, 8.1 million people that lived on the island of Ireland in 1841, probably with a very heavy uh, undercount because a lot of uh, uh, Irish speakers just would rather not have their landlords know that they're there and they live with relatives and so on. There's a great book called uh, uh, The End of, uh, of Hidden Ireland. So these people that don't show, but they're the closest people to the folklore and the truest to the uh, 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 Celtic uh, language and Celtic customs, they're really on the bottom. Uh, by 48, the British government is solving the problem by saying, you know, somebody local in, is gonna have to pay for this in Ireland. So they start taxing the, um, the landlords that if somebody comes and they're your tenant, you have to pay a certain amount to the poor house. The poor houses had just started within 10 years for most cases. They're woefully overcrowded, double is nothing. The deaths are extraordinary. And how do you solve it when your tenants are going to raise your taxes? You evict them. So in the middle of this famine, you wind up with 500,000 people evicted. And an Irish eviction, the class three houses are basically mud huts. They're a wattle and daub, which means you, uh, if you get enough wood, you get walls and then you cover them with, uh, with dung and with, uh, with clay and make it look like the traditional places that we think of, but with very few windows. And they just tore those down. Uh, we always like to think that, uh, well, um, they're somehow different in the East because they don't have the ruins that they have in the West. No, in the West, they had more stone so they could build stone houses. But in the East, they were done with the, with the clay and the uh, mixture of, of sticks and, and things like that. They went down real quick. You can't find them at all. Uh, you lost 31% uh, of one uh, county like Mayo. You lost 29% from Monaghan. Monaghan is in the east, the northeast of, of Ireland. So where did these people go? Well, we know that a million of them certainly died. They died of disease as much as they did of outright starvation. Two million of them uh, took off, sometimes with assistance. Here's your, here's your uh, hat and what's your hurry and you can get a one-way ticket. And by the way, we're gonna send you to Canada because it's cheaper. And that's where the really, uh, the really uh, difficult uh, uh, ships were, were sent, things that were rumored to have been left over from the slave trade that had oh, their only real use was bringing lumber over, over to, uh, to Europe, to the, uh, Great Britain. And who's gonna to want to go back or put anything valuable in that? And so you take the poorest of the immigrants and you send them out on the, uh, on the ships that wind up as what are referred to as the coffin ships. Well, these people are huge, a huge number of people. They change forever the de uh, demographics of New York State and much of the United States as well. So that brings us 1848, talking about the summer of 48 for the fire. Imagine what new group of people are there, the poorest, the least educated, most of them not uh, Irish speaking. A lot of my people did not speak Irish at that time. And uh, what they spelled of English wasn't great. And what people did is they found that, you know that cellar that nobody wants to live in? I've got somebody to live there. That attic, fill it up. So the degree of crowding, which would be there anywhere, anyway, 
that, we, that will bring us up by the 1850 census, somewhere right around 50,000 people. They are packed in and they're also going to be homeless, so many of them. So the, um, uh, the number of disasters which occur, the cholera epidemic, which will follow, uh, the, a lot of our, uh, uh, of our orphanages are built at this time uh, because there's just a lot of kids with nobody to care for them. And it's, it's a very tragic time. So what do we say, what happened? First thing is, let's get a paid professional fire department. And so we think 1848, same month, they pass a law on it, wonderful. They didn't keep it. They let it drag on for a while. And by, I think, uh, 57, they just wiped it out and went back to the volunteer system. So it really isn't the birthday that we would think would happen. Uh, other disasters in uh, 1905 or six with the uh, Myers collapse, you know, that's August. August is a tough time for disasters. Uh, the same month they just came up with the building of, uh, of code enforcement. Not a coincidence uh, because the building crushed a whole lot of people in it. Another story for another time. So in this case, they started a paid fire department. They didn't stick with it. The fire departments at that time had a tradition which was very rich. Some of them were clubs with very wealthy people. Others were uh, one ethnic group or another ethnic group. Some were supported by a particular type of business to make sure they had the best of everything. In the middle of the Civil War, now you're back to the system of volunteers only. In the time of the city uh, of, of the uh, Civil War, Troy, who had learned to get pumpers, uh, the, the steam pumpers rather than the hand pumpers, uh, Albany didn't have them. And why did they get interested in having them? Why did these people, as Tony mentioned, uh, from uh, business people decide to get one of these shiny new steamers and name it after James McQuaid? because they knew they needed efficiency. Why do you need efficiency? Because everybody, when they did that in 1864, your healthiest young men are wearing a uniform and they're probably in Virginia or someplace. And so you have a labor shortage in a system which will only let you work for 15 minutes at a time without total exhaustion, take a little break and then come back. and. Uh, pump. So the whole technology changes. Uh, and finally, what else happens is uh, the wood of the, uh, of the Adirondacks was so rich, and it was all hardwood in those days, it had never quite developed. And now you had uh, the, the country growing by leaps and, and, and leaps and bounds, leaps and bounds. And here's all this wood. So a lot of them, some of it had been given away so people would settle it, nobody settled in it. It went back to tax delinquency and then it was all owned by the, the state. You could buy an acre of land for a nickel an acre, all with virgin forest. So there's a boom and you can build with uh, wood. They, you look on our maps there and you take a look at along the Erie Canal are lumber yards owned by private companies and private families, one right after the other. Look on the map, it looks like a, a, like a comb. You know, the, these are all separate areas where you could go in and to the left and the right, you had stacks and stacks of lumber and you were ready to build over everything with wood again. Uh, that wood is referred to as Albany lumber, not Adirondack lumber. Albany lumber meant the Adirondack uh, lumber and a fortune was made. In fact, we sent, uh, we literally sent wood to California. Why? Because they had lots of wood, but they didn't have any sawmills. And so this wood went everywhere. And the city fathers, 
and mothers hopefully, although said did quietly, uh, said, you know what? If you go and rebuild too much of Albany or adjoining the downtown with all this cheap wood and all these immigrants who would love to build anything that's cheap because there's a tremendous housing shortage, it's going to be a problem. And what do you and I see today because of that fire? It's another law that was passed shortly after. It said, if you're gonna build on this side of Lark Street, you're gonna build on this side of Clinton Avenue. If you're going to build on a sort of a, a more difficult way, let's just say over by Center Square and what's now Lincoln Park, if that's your boundaries and of course the river, you're gonna build with brick. And one thing that Albany has always had a lot of book, brick, and they were certainly using a brick at that, at that time because you can build high as well. Uh, every building is being built with brick after 1848. Uh, one day I came down Madison Avenue. Uh, some of you know State Street very well below, um, it's in Center Square below uh, uh, Lark Street. And there's uh, two wooden buildings together and another one across the street. And these are built in the 1830s. You know, they got in there before or 1840s at, at the top. And so I drove down once on Madison Avenue and it was within the fire uh, lines. And there's this beautiful wooden house, Victorian, and it looked like 1870s. And it was a plaque from historic Albany. And I said, that's impossible. And so I said, how could we have a wooden building there when everybody else, and they mean all the way around, he said, it isn't, it's a brick building. They got so sick of the brick building that they put a, uh, they put a front on it of wood so they could have the only wooden building there. It's, it's still there, it's just above Swan Street on the, on the south side. Uh, so we had changes. And finally, we realized things had to be modernized. And when we did, we took the man who was at one time off and on, not consistently, he was the chief engineer, we'd call him the chief. Uh, and they took James McQuaid, who was uh, just a, a legend in his own right. He was known uh, inter, uh, uh, through all the different states and he had all kinds of uh, feelings about how people should properly protect cities with fire and how firefighters should work. Uh, they established the first real consistent uh, fire department that still goes on today. And this is the same organization whose um, devotees and, and people who really care about it are trying to get and are already getting a, a, a fire, fire a fighters a, a museum because we have a rich history that goes back long before this and continually go on for many years. It's changed in many different ways. McQuaid was there for a very long time. He was there for 16 years. When he died in uh, 1886, then another Irishman by the name of Higgins, uh, both of them, I think, were born in Albany of Irish born parents, then he became the next fire chief. So the tradition of having uh, Irish firefighters from the top to the bottom uh, goes back to this, this time. Yes. You said 16 years, but the graphic says 26. Yeah, 26. Yeah. Did I say? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just math was never a strong thing. <laughs> and then you wonder why city budgets are in trouble. Yeah. Okay, so it was yeah. 26, though. Yeah, it was yeah. 26. I was reading yeah. the numbers on and, there. And, and, and he yeah. had been yeah. um, he, he had, had been in the department, I think, since the late 40s. Mm -hmm. So uh, so do did employers allow the volunteers to leave work to fight a fire is a question online. They had a number of privileges. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. yeah. Because I mean, the, the way the alarms were, were that the, they um, uh, had arrangements with churches for um, ringing bells for fire alarms. And I'm assuming that they must have, because how else would they get the men to fight the fires? Sure. Um, and a lot of the, um, a lot of the um, stuff that we've uncovered is not surprisingly, the men lived very close to their particular houses. 
so that, um, you know, for example, I'm trying to think of what the closest one, there was one on Wilson Street, right, a block north of here. And if you look at the roster and the addresses, they all lived within that. Um, so if that, and that was Engine 10. So if the fire was something in the jurisdiction of Engine 10, the men would probably be very close by. Well, not, not only that, if you were an employer, we talked about <laughs> right. this, this fire here, with maybe 20 buildings involved over there, hundreds of buildings involved. If there's a fire in your neighborhood, it could be you very easily. Right. And you're not going to say, why don't you wait and finish <laughs> that wagon before you go and join your friends? Mm -hmm. There also there was prestige to it. There was also a benefit. You couldn't serve on uh, jury duty. Uh, you, you could say, no, I won't. I'm a fireman. OK, you don't have to. Yeah, and you didn't yeah. have to be um, uh, called up for the uh, militia unless there was an insurrection. Yeah. So, um, and you didn't, uh, th this one cracked me up. You didn't have to work for the superintendent of highways. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there were things that we think are kind of odd might've been very different yeah. um, for people back then. All right, I'm just looking. And so if anyone else has a question on Zoom, you can type it into the Q&A or the chat function and then our live audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there a women's artillery? I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I think that the uh, the women had to put up with the men being out of the house. Um, yeah, I know in um, the city they were saying, you know, that's how a lot of the gangs of New York started because they would be rival, yeah. you know, kind of fire gangs. Was there another question in here? And we had rival gang. We had, I should say, rival companies here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there are stories of, um, Give one of your stories, stories of too. fights. Well, one of my favorites, um, it was a fire that took place um, on Schuyler Street, just below the mansion. Mm. Um, so it was somewhere between Pearl and Clinton. I think it was between Pearl and Broad, um, you know, one small block. There were four companies that were um, uh, fighting the fire. And a lot of the times, you know, the reservoirs would go low and the water would, you know, the water would be low. But the story that made it into the common council minutes was that two of the companies, there were four companies left, fire was almost out, the water was low anyway. So two of the companies were sent home, you know, sent to their, back to their firehouses and um, two were left. And um, one company, which apparently was a historic rivalry, there was a company on Bleecker Street, um, which barely exists anymore. And there was another company on Arch Street where the former DMV building is. And someone from Engine 11, which was on Arch Street, shot a slingshot at somebody from Engine 8, who was on, uh, they were on Bleecker Street. And these were the only two companies that were left at the Schuyler Street fire. So the way the common council minutes euphemistically described it was he was put upon roughly. <laughs> um, so um, they, um, so that kind of broke up. Engine 11 went back to their house and um, came back to the fire scene with paving blocks and started a riot. And they, in, this is all described in the council minutes. It's a really great story. Um, there was drinking and they were um, they were claimed or they were named to be the bully boys, and as a result, they disbanded Engine Company Number Eleven, and they were um, this was 1849, so they were actually paid. So there was um, a very dramatic passage about how they were a disgrace to the city, they were a disgrace to their neighborhood, they were a disgrace to the uh, fire department. And we can't have that. If we're going to pay these guys, we expect them to behave nicely. Yeah. And so, but the funny thing about it is, yes, they disbanded them. And you think like, oh, well, there's no more Engine 11. Well, within a couple of months, they reform Engine 11. And I don't know how many of those miscreants. that were, yeah, <laughs> miscreants, right, were brought back. Um, of, in 1860, the same two companies got at it again when there was a fire somewhere downtown you know the, the commercial downtown 
And when they were going back, Engine 11, which were the bully boys from Engine 40, uh, from 1849, got ahead of Engine 8. And when they got to Van Zandt Street, they pulled their pumper into Van Zandt Street and strung the ropes across South Pearl Street and tripped up um, engine no eight. So oh. no, there were no horses at the time. Oh. These were the guys pulling by hand. They were pulling the pumpers. This is not, and that, that's not really. I mean, those are, you know, funny stories. Mm -hmm. But at earlier than the fire, sometime early in 1848, there was another um, battle at State and Pearl, um, where they blocked one company blocked. South Pearl Street, so the other company couldn't get to the fire, and a riot ensued there, and um, somebody was actually shot. Um, so and this Tony, was, was there an ethnic component to that, or you know, rather than just rivalry? I think this might be a little too early for yeah, an ethnic component saying. because you know by the 1860s um, there are serious Irish companies. Yeah, you know, and, lots mm -hmm. like course, there's lost. one from 1866 where. Um, 30 out of 50 members were born in Ireland. Okay, yeah. um, I don't think there was that kind of, there might have been a class um, mm. struggle right, here. Right, yeah, yeah. Because, because there has to be, you would think, you know, there's some rivalry or some Yeah, well, one, of, one of the things about the volunteer period is that everybody was a fireman. Okay. So the mayor was a fireman, the lawyers, the architects, the, mm -hmm. you know, the bankers and so on, mm -hmm. as well as the working people, okay. the working so men. Okay, so probably was class. So there was, yeah. I think, oh, yeah. were, you know, if you were to yeah. look at the rosters, I think you would see mm -hmm. that there were, you know, high status mm -hmm. companies versus mm -hmm. more working class companies. Yeah, before it became an ethnic. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then I think what what happened was when you got the paid department, mm -hmm. I don't think that the um, the service and the fire department was so universal like it had been during the volunteer period. Now, the first Irish mayor is uh, 1878, and that's Mayor Michael Nolan. And there's a wonderful bronze bell that's over on uh, Upper Lincoln, uh, Lincoln Park. And mm -hmm. you'll see his name there. And it says fire commissioner, mm -hmm. because this, this was important business as yeah. it still is today. But uh, especially then you could yeah. you could lose an entire neighborhood yeah. there, there were actually yeah. um references in the council minutes they call it the most important function in the city that's how seriously they took firefighting so we had two questions on zoom does the steam room McQuaid still exist and is there any book or like a pamphlet written about the albany firefighters oh tony has no, a book yeah. that's yeah. being written <laughs> that will show yeah. a lot of this <laughs> There will be one soon. There will be one published this year. Yeah. Um, so. And the McQuaid pump, does that still exist? The steamer? No, that that's interesting because um, they these steamer companies built only a few steamers. Like this company, the company that built this was in New York, and I think they only built about ten. Mm. And this one was only used for a few years because they were kind of they were sort of experimental. They yeah. were getting. Better, better each time yeah but when this this one was only used for a few years and there's a handwritten note in one of the annual reports that this one had been sent to whitehall mm. um up you know up the uh at lake champlain and then i just came across something where um it was traded to um, Lysander Button, who was in Waterford and built like 1400 mm. fire engines. It was traded to him. And then the newspaper said, and the word is that it went to Pittsburgh. So, and that was probably in the 1870s or something. So they weren't, they weren't used very long. And well, how old is the one that's over in the museum? That you know, I have, I don't know, but they, they ended up um, in 67 when they professionalized, they ended up with Amaskag, which was um, in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And they supplied, you know, probably hundreds mm -hmm. of uh, steam engines all across the country as well. Like it's an amazing time for technology. We just, yesterday was McCormick's birthday, you know, the Reaper and the Harvester mm -hmm. in 1847 was, you know, when they mm -hmm. came up with their first Reaper. So machinery was getting better, yeah. like, and, and more automated and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Do any of you have any questions or comments? And the Zoom people don't forget. Tell me whose hand is up, Carol, yeah. Well, I don't understand. So steam 
steamers were the new technology, so why wasn't the beaver done? I'm sorry, I'm not. Like, I'm gonna... Well, it seems like you're saying that this steamer was replaced with other steamers. Yeah. So what was it about the original steamer that was that well, was insufficient? For I, I think that yeah, I it's I can't really. Pump, they said. Yeah, yeah, I can't really speak to the technology, Bill. You wanna? Yeah. Sorry, wait. No, for the people yeah. on Zoom, um, we have a member in the audience answering the question. This is yeah. Jim. Yeah, and it, so you know these were that was I, I, Bill Tobler, by the way, yeah. in the back of the and room here. I think these yeah. were probably like early computers or something, where they were, you know, they were state of the art for just a very short time because they were constantly making improvements yeah. to them, and so they weren't. And you know, I read some something in the minutes or the annual reports or something where the boilers were condemned is what they called it, and I think that meant that they were you know Unsafe. dangerous yeah. or something you know sure, right? elements must burn out and yeah. all kinds of things you know yeah so any other questions how would the steam work this well the, the steam is what propelled the water mm -hmm. as okay. opposed to the pumper okay yeah that's something that yeah. i had a hard time understanding at first yeah. too yeah so and that's why they went from 850 Firemen in 1865 to 169 yeah. in 1867. So yeah. for the people on Zoom, because you didn't hear Bill's answer, he was saying it was a, a very labor intensive, you know, thing at the start because men literally had to pull the thing and pump up and down. And then, you know, you can get a horse to pull it or you can get steam to propel, you yeah. know. So um, that's why the, the workforce, you didn't need as many men. Mm -hmm. uh, any last questions or comments? Yeah. I'm sorry. So prior to, at the time of the Albany fire, were all of these fire engines, which of course didn't even have the benefit of the steam, right? were they also not horse pulled? They were made right. pulled? Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess that's why it took them four hours to get from Cahos yeah. <laughs> you know, in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I was going to ask, how could it take four hours? Yeah. Because yeah. men are hauling. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they, they call them drag ropes. You know, they, they really did drag yeah. them. And, you know, imagine the condition of the roads. Yeah. And, um, Mod you know, sure, probably, yeah. so, you know, not only, and that was, that was another thing that McQuaid talked about that, you know, the, that hand pulling the, um, engines, the pumpers to the fires you know they were exhausted by the time they got there and it was also considered kind of like a lowly thing to do i mean why are we doing this when we could get horses mm -hmm. to pull the steamers and mm -hmm. and that will free up the strength of the men yeah. who will then fight the fire so instead of you know instead of dragging the engine to the fire and then hand pumping this was the you know the wave of the future mm -hmm. it was also the reason why you had firehouses sometimes two blocks away yeah. another one two blocks yeah. away because you only had two blocks to go right yeah. and yeah if, i mean if you today we'll say there's one in the south end and one in the north end mm -hmm. and could be because we're mechanized yeah and if you look at you know like these the two battling companies engine eight and engine 11 they were i don't even think a quarter mile apart mm -hmm. and wow. you know if you look at the density you know, they went up to before the before the reorganization, there were 18 companies mm -hmm. and they went down to six engines and two hook and ladders. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you didn't need as many men, you didn't need as many companies. And with the horses, one of the benefits was they could get to the fire faster. Mm -hmm. um, so. I'm sorry to keep asking questions. They're all good, though. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, so in the 1600s, 
there were carriages drawn by horses. Now, I don't know when that started. Um, maybe it started in the 1500s, but I know that, you know, 1600s, 1700s, there were carriages drawn by horses. Why would firefighting equipment not because be? Because what are they going to, what are they going to pull? Mm -hmm. You're talking about bucket brigades mm -hmm. because there's nothing to pull. The, the, there's no firefighting apparatus other than a bucket or a lot of buckets. And, you know, in the earlier days, before there was a, um, a, a, even the first most primitive engine, you had, everybody had to have buckets in their houses to, um, yeah. you know, staff the bucket brigade. The women and children brought the empty buckets back to the water source, the men threw, you know, you're just going kind of like this, mm -hmm. throwing it on the, the fire. In 1732, the city buys a fire engine, but it's the size of like a little kid's wagon. I don't even know if it was as big as this bench. Um, and so you didn't need horses to pull that. And so, you know, it really, and uh, you know, the, really the history of the department is the history of technological innovation. So you go from bucket brigades to primitive engines, to hand pumpers, to steamers, mm -hmm. to gas powered fire engines. And probably like suspension and balance and all of that. Oh, yeah, and if, you yeah. know, I'm looking at this, like this is obviously well balanced and yeah. you know, you can attach horses to that thing, but maybe other ones you couldn't, you know, yeah. because- And also, the yeah. Be, and yeah. another thing too, uh, you know, almost in you know, regarding that is that mm -hmm. with the Albany Hills, there were stories of the um, engines being, you know, uh, losing control of yeah. the engine. Because, you know, there was some, there's a story that, you know, Bill would know this as well, coming down State Street and turning north onto oh, to North Pearl Street. Yeah. Imagine that, when, today, you know, what mine. kind of braking system <laughs> were yeah. uh, on these pumpers. Yeah. And then, you know, you kind of, and they crash, they go on the sidewalk, they break the, yeah. you know, they break the equipment and all that yeah. stuff. So, yeah, Mike. Teacher, if I may make one point, uh, until you have a paid fire department, you don't have anybody in the firehouses who's going to take care of the horses. Uh, right. Well, they didn't have before when they didn't have when they had a volunteer fire uh, department. They didn't have horses. Right. Well, because yeah, because right. they didn't. Uh, because there's yeah. Yeah. No one there to care for right. Them. Right. Yeah. You know, and it's expensive to feed a horse. Closet and take them out once a week. Yeah. I mean, you know, they kind of want to be fed and watered. Yep. Exercise and, and exercised, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Products. And this is all, this yep. is all going to be in the book. Yeah. <laughs> because, well, on that note, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. So look, we'll just wind up the online stuff because it's um, getting hectic. But thank you everyone for joining. Um, sorry about the technological issues. It's just a bit of a nightmare here. So we want to thank the Hudson Valley. We want to thank our two speakers, Tony and Jack, and to our live audience. We are going to continue the conversation and I'm sure we'll have the two men back. And certainly when the book is written and Absolutely. it's written, we have to publish it. We'll do a launch maybe as well and, and a, a co-party for them. So thank you all uh, online. We'll talk to you. Our next talk is next week, actually the 23rd. God, I hope I'm right. <laughs> I, I think it's the 23rd. We've got a presentation on Brexit. Uh, with Peter Maloney, PhD, and Richard Aulis, PhD, from Bard University down there. They're going to talk to us about Brexit, the protocol, the whole implications for Northern Ireland at the moment, and the Good Friday Agreement. So stay tuned. Thanks Great. very much, guys. Yeah. Take care.